Bolo Hari Hari Mokonda Morari Rama Krishna Haya Driva Bolo Hari Hari Mokonda Morari Rajendra Nanda Tana Gatana, Kaisa Bashatana, Jaya Dasarati Rama. Tana Gatana, Kaisa Bashatana, Jaya Dasarati Rama. Yashoda Dula Lao Govinda Gopala Vrindavana Purandhara Yashoda Dula Lao Govinda Gopala Vrindavana Purandhara Gopi Priya Janna Radhika Ramana Uvana Sundara Bora Gopi Priya Janna Radhika Ramana Uvana Sundara Bora Gopi Priya Janna Radhika Ramana Uvana Bora Ravana Thakra Rama Kana Tattara Gopi Jana Vashrahari Ravana Thakra Rama Kana Tattara Gopi Jana Vashrahari Rajera Rakala Gopa Vrinda Palo Chicha Hari Vamsi Dahari Rajera Rakala Gopa Vrinda Palo Chicha Hari Vamsi Dahari Yogindra Bandana, Sri Nanda Nandana, Raja Jana Bhaya Hari. Yogindra Bandana, Sri Nanda Nandana, Raja Jana Bhaya Hari. Nabina Nira Rupa Manohara, 
Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayanam Namaskrityam Naram Chaiva Narotamam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam Tato Jayamudiraya Nasta Praeshu Vabadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhakti Bhavati Naishtiki We're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3 Chapter number five, entitled or chapter number eleven, entitled "Calculation of Time from the Atom." Text number thirty-two. Anta satasmin salila. Anta satasmin salila Aste nanta sanohari Aste nanta sanohari Yoga nidra nimithak nimilaksha Yoga Nidra Nimi Laksha Yoga Nidra Nimi Laksha Stuyamano Janalaye Stuyamano Janalaye Stuyamano Jalalane Stuyamano Janalaye Antasatasmin Salila Asti nanta sanohari Yoga nidra nimi laksha Stuyamano janalaya Antasatasmin salila Asti nanta sanohari Yoga Nidra Nimi Laksa Stuyamano Janalaya Antasatasmin Salila Antasatasmin Salila Asti Nanta Sanohari Asti Nanta Sanohari Yoga Nidra Nimi Laksa Yoga Nidra Nimi Laksa Stuyamano Yoga Nidra Nimi Laksha, Stuyamano Janalaya, 
Anta within sa this as as asmin in that salli lay what is it ona water aste there is ananta ananta Asana, Asana. On, the, on the on the on the feet on the seat of uh, Harihi, Harihi the Lord, the Lord. Yoga Nidra Mystic Sleep No oh, Nidra Sleep Yeah. And then yoga. they feel the heat and it gets so hot for them, they go up to Tapaloka. Oh, we should explain the structure of the universe, right? There's a, in every universe you have the Bhumandala, Bhu we're in Bhumandala, and above Bhumandala, Bhubhav, Bhubhar, and then you have the Devas, the region of the demigods and then above the demigods region above swarga the heavenly region then there are four more different planetary system planets above that and they they go higher and higher way up to the top at the very top of the universe is satyaloka which is the planet of lord brahma and just below satyaloka you have tapaloka and below that, Mahaloka and Janaloka. So Maha, these are four different planets where very, very pious living entities go. Living entities who are like great sages or great yogis or something. They're, they're eligible to enter into these planets which are way up at the top of the universe. And so it's described here that when the partial annihilation takes place and the lower regions are on fire, the heat at the lower region of the universe is so great that it goes all the way up to Maharloka and Janaloka. And the, the, the sages who live there, they feel the heat and they, they all go to Tapaloka, they go up. The next planet above, they go up to Tapaloka. And Tapaloka, that's where the four Kumaras usually stay. You can read the Brihad Bhagavad Amrita, Sanatana Goswami's book, describing about these different regions in the universe. We don't get a lot of information about these regions in the Srimad Bhagavatam. But Sanatana Goswami describes more about it in the second half of the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. It's describing about Gokumara. Gokumara is a cowherd boy from Govardhan, and he's given a mantra by his guru 
and by the power of the mantra from the Guru, he could travel everywhere. And he it describes how he travels to these different regions within the universe, and then he goes beyond the universe. He goes through the coverings of the universe, and he goes into the Brahma Jyoti. Then he goes into the spiritual world, and he goes to the different regions in Vaikuntha, and then he goes to Goloka. And it's wonderful descriptions describing about the nature of uh, life there. If you're curious to know what's it like in Vaikuntha, what's it like in Goloka, you just read Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, Sanatana Goswami. He's explaining everything there to us. So he, he explains also how Gokumara, how he went to these different regions. He went first to the heavenly planets. And then from the heavenly planets, he, he, he didn't feel so satisfied in the heavenly planets. But then some sages, some great sages came from some other place. And he was asking the people in the heavenly planets, where did they come from? And they said, oh, they came from Janaloka, Mahaloka. And so Gopumar, he heard about these places and by the power of his mantra, he went there. And he went to Mahaloka, Janaloka. And the great sages like Bhrigu were there and they're doing yagya. They're performing yagyas there. And the Lord is personally appearing from the yajna and accepting their offering. So it's described like that in Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. But here in the verse today, we hear that the, they left. The, they left the Mahaloka and went up to Kapaloka because the heat was so great. In Tapaloka, every, the four Kumaras are there, and everybody in Tapaloka, they're all engaged in meditation. The, the, the four Kumaras, what they do Astanga Yoga, and they're all, you know, they're all just in, in trance, meditating on the Lord. And there's a wonderful discussion there where they argue about. You know, they say meditation is better than other processes because they say meditation, we can be with the Lord all the time. And Gokumar says, well, I, I enjoy my personal relationship with the Lord, that you're meditating on the Lord, but he said, I'm personal, I'm having personal exchanges with the Lord which is more meaningful to me than just simply concentrating my mind on the Lord. So that is the fruit of bhakti, that if we go on in bhakti, we, we can actually enjoy personal exchanges with the Lord. So tapaloka, everybody there is just doing, they're just in trance, they practice this meditation. Anyway, Srila Prabhupada brings up the point here today about yoga nidra, that the Lord is sleeping, but his sleeping is not like our sleeping. Srila Prabhupada used to chastise us often sleeping. <laughs> you know, when we go to class, we sit in class, you know, we, we have that problem trying to stay awake, trying to concentrate. Of course, here you have quite a big place and you have a lot of air conditioners running. And it's pretty cool in here this morning, actually. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling the cold. But uh, often we would be in small rooms. And, you know, I remember in London, our temple was in Bury Place, 
and we had a small rented property and the temple room was quite small and we would be packed in there and you know it would get very hot. Shang Sundar had built it, he had renovated the whole place to make it something like Noah's Ark almost. <laughs> he brought a lot of wood from Canada and renovated the whole interior. So the place would really heat up when we would have kirtan. And then we'd all sit and sometimes difficult to concentrate. So Prabhupada would notice <laughs> and he would say, you're all sleeping, wake up. <laughs> so sometimes devotees would argue and say, Prabhupada, I'm not sleeping. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada would say, if your eyes are closed and you're not moving, you must be asleep. <laughs> like that, Prabhupada. Nobody could argue and defeat Prabhupada. So here, the Lord is sleep, mystic slumber, and Prabhupada points out that it is transcendental. And he said, wherever this word yoga is used, it indicates transcendental activities of the Lord. Just like we have yoga peak in Mayapur, the yoga peak is there, the place of the where Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appears. He comes to this world where he come, is coming from the spiritual world and he manifests himself for his pastime here on this planet 500 and more years ago in Mayapur. So we refer to that holy place as the Yoga Peak. So it's a, a transcendental place. And similarly, the Lord's slumber is also transcendental. It is not in any way material. The Lord is absolute. Whatever emotions he is expressing, it is transcendental. It's not under the modes of nature, because the modes of nature are under the control of the Lord. Mayajakshina prakriti suyate satsaratri. This material nature is moving under my direction of son of Kunti. So the material nature is under Lord Krishna's control. He is not controlled by it. Rather, he controls the material nature. We are controlled by the material nature. We are not on the level of the Lord. We have to understand our position. We have to also connect with the Lord by yoga. We want to become transcendental. So we practice yoga, the mystic yoga, bhakti yoga. And by the yoga of devotion, we can connect ourselves to the Supreme Lord and become transcendental. We certainly want to be transcendental. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes how we can become transcendental. Mam chayo vayabicharena bhakti yogena sevati sagunam samati chaikam brahma guyaya kaupate. Simply by engaging in the service of the Lord, then we transcend the modes of material nature and we come to the level of Brahman. Of course, Lord Krishna puts a condition on this statement. He said that, when you, that you should engage in, in his devotional service without falling down. In other words, our service should be uninterrupted. It should not be sporadic. It should not be on and off. It should be continuous. The nature of devotional service is uninterrupted. Srimad Bhagavatam 
Purushanto Sutta, Sutta Goswami describes the Vaipum Sam Paro Dharmo Yato Bhakti Radho Saji Ahai Taki Apritiyata Yayatma Supratidati. The supreme occupation for all humanity to attain is loving service unto the Lord. Such service should be unmotivated and uninterrupted in order to completely satisfy the self. Right? We want to come to that level of devotional service where our service is ahaitaki apreti atta, unmotivated and uninterrupted. We often see in material life, everything we do is motivated. <laughs> to be unmotivated, people must think you're mad. If everyone has their motivation. But devotional service, we're told to become unmotivated. In other words, we have to do things simply for the pleasure of Krishna. Why should we do it? Because Krishna wants us to do it. We're doing it for Krishna, for his pleasure. We want to please him. That is the mood of the pure devotees. They simply want to satisfy Lord Krishna. There's no consideration of myself or what I should get. But it's simple. what can I do to please Krishna? What does Lord Krishna want me to do? Of course, devotees often find it difficult to think in this way. I mean, sometimes we think, well, well, I can do it for my guru. We have a, you know, devotees often have a lot of guru bhakti, and they will do it for their guru. But in course of time, the guru departs from the world, and after the guru is gone, then it's difficult for us to find our place again and to focus. Of course, service to the guru is not different from service to Krishna. If you satisfy the spiritual master, then certainly Krishna will be pleased. The Guru is representative of Krishna, and whatever service we are offering to him, he will offer to his Guru, and ultimately it will all go to Krishna. It is meant for Krishna. So we want to come to that level of transcendence. We want to transcend the material energy, and it's not easy. It's a difficult struggle because that energy, although it's material, it is Lord Krishna's energy. And from the Bhagavad Gita again, Lord Krishna describes Daibihi Esha Gunamai Mama Maya Duratrika. That this material energy of mine is very difficult to overcome. It is dura, yeah, very difficult. We know it's a struggle to fight against the material energy. But Devi Mama Devi Esha Gunamai Mama Maya Dura Mameva Ye Prapajante Mayam Etam Tarantite. That if you sur surrender unto me, then you can easily cross beyond. So we take help of Lord Krishna. We don't just fight on our own. That's the difference between bhakti and jnana and yoga. Jnana and jnanis and yogis, they're fighting on their own. They're, they're making their attempt to achieve transcendence by their own efforts. But in Krishna consciousness, we are taking shelter of 
Lord Krishna. And we depend on Lord Krishna to help us and to bring us out from this material world, to take us out of the, this wheel of birth and death. It's not by our own efforts, but it's by our surrender to him, by taking shelter of Lord Krishna, then he will deliver us. So the devotees have that difference between the jnanis and the yogis. And they may have so much knowledge, they may do so many great austerities, that's not going to get us Krishna. It's not going to get us love for God. We have to simply approach the Lord with loving feelings, with the mood of devotion. And of course, devotion means service. Not that simply sentiment, that, oh yes, I love Krishna. But we have to show that feeling of love for Krishna by practical activities. How much time, how much effort do we make for the service of Krishna? How much are we sacrificing for Krishna? So as we, as we approach Krishna, Krishna says, I reward you accordingly. We're on the path of surrender to Krishna. As Srila Prabhupada would state to us, to be a Vaishnava is not a very easy thing. It will take some time. We're trying to cultivate that mood of Vaishnava to become devotees. But it takes some time. Impurities are there, attachments are there. We have to overcome all the different obstacles on the path of devotion. But we are convinced that certainly by the grace of Krishna, we can be successful. Not so much by our own efforts, but by the grace of Krishna. There's one very interesting illustration in the Bhagavad Gita. You must have seen it. There's a picture. It's one of the paintings done by devotees. One, you can see the devotee is in the ocean. There's water everywhere. And you see the head of a devotee. And he's got his hand up. You know, he's in the water. Just swimming, somehow floating on the surface of the ocean. And Lord Krishna is coming on the back of Garuda and he's coming to pick him up out of the ocean of material existence. So our plight is like that. We're in that situation. We're in that ocean of material existence. And we are calling out to the Lord, please save me, please pick me up, take me out of this wheel of birth and death, take me out of this realm of so many miseries, take me back home. One of the points which is brought up in this section where they're speaking about the, the annihilations taking place. That, that, that they say it's surprising that although there's constant annihilation taking place, still people are working so hard trying to build, trying to create a wonderful existence for themselves in this temporary world of birth and death. Mm. We can, we see, you know, we ourselves are guilty of that. We're working hard and collecting, saving, we want to get a home, purchase a property, so much money, 
and then you get cars and all of these things. But you know, they're all temporary. And with the end of life, they're useless. You cannot take anything with you. In, as they say in India, you know, Kalihat Ayate, Kalihat Chalbo. Right? We come to this world with nothing and we will leave with nothing. But in the course of our short existence, the few years which we spend here in this material world, we make great attempts, great efforts to acquire more and more. But ultimately, we have to leave it all behind. Can take anything with what do you take with you? You you do take your karma. You take your devotion with you. Whatever advancement, whatever progress you've made in devotional service, you go on from that point in the next life. We will continue. So we, it, uh, uh, sometimes we talk about our spiritual bank balance. Right? We have, just like you have your bank balances, you have your bank account, we have also a spiritual bank account. The devotion, the activities which we have done, how much have we sacrificed for Krishna? How much have we kept for ourselves? Krishna knows, and Krishna wants to see, are we, re are we going to surrender? Are we going to give up everything for the service of Krishna? Ultimately, we have to one day let go of everything. But in the course of the time, we want to make efforts to strengthen our feelings for Krishna our attachments for his service. And as we're doing, by having these programs, by maintaining the center here in Singapore, where, where everything is so expensive, that this has become the most expensive place to stay. <laughs> I thought Hong Kong was being, but they said, no, Singapore is more expensive, even wow. <laughs> and difficult for people to eat, just to get food here. Of course, there's some people doing free food distribution. There's some people going on in that way, distributing free meals. But that's not our real business as devotees. And Prabhupada also wasn't so much anxious for that. He liked that we would preach the message of Krishna consciousness, to distribute the message of Krishna to everyone. Let people know the nature of the material world. Of course, we're not only pessimistic. In Buddhism, they only speak about the misery of the material world. That material life means suffering. They don't have any spiritual world. Oh, sometimes, some other teachers, they speak about the, the Western world, the Western land, or the the world where everyone becomes a Buddha. They, 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 but their emphasis is more on the miseries of the world. And some temples, they keep dead bodies there just to remind people that this is what's coming. It's coming one day. Your body the body which you've dedicated so much time and energy to take care of, one day it's just going to be bones. All the flesh will rot 
and the distant skeleton will remain. And so in Buddhism, they emphasize that aspect that we're just bones, nothing. Because their philosophy is life has no meaning, that everything is zero. But we, we also express the nature of the material world. Dukala yama shasvata, temporary place of misery. We also talk about the miseries of the material world, adi baltic, adi daily, adi atme. We talk about these things, but we don't only talk about that. We also talk about the spiritual side of things, the pleasure of spiritual life. For Buddhism, there's nothing. They just talk about suffering, and we want to avoid the suffering, how to avoid the suffering, or oh, stop everything, negate everything, make everything zero. But we say, no, it's not zero. Everything is one, everything is Krishna. And we want to also be there with Krishna. And there is enjoyment there. Sometimes people cannot understand these things. They think to enjoy is wrong. They see the devotees blissful and happy. Oh, must be material. They do not understand the nature of transcendence, that there is transcendence. And on the transcendental platform, there is enjoyment, there is pleasure. It is not that everything is nothing. And it's not that everything is simply one, but it's one with variety. There is oneness with variety. As Srila Prabhupada talks about creating unity out of diversity, bringing everyone to Mayapur every year to create unity out of diversity that there's so many diverse cultures and diverse devotees in different parts of the world, all trying to practice Krishna consciousness in different conditions. And they're coming to Mayapur every year to, to unite and to discuss how they can go on and continue to spread Krishna consciousness benefit from each other's association. We were hearing last night Bhakti Purushottam Swami was appreciating the Singapore devotees who were helping him in his uh, tribal preaching there. That's a nice example. Unity out of diversity. Srila Prabhupada liked that we would all come together and work together to distribute the message of Krishna, to bring transcendence to this miserable material world. And transcendence means also spiritual pleasure, spiritual enjoyment, spiritual anxiety. One time I was distributing books, and we had one book, and we had this cookbook by Kurma. Kurma, did he come here sometimes? Did you have cooking demonstrations by Kurma? Did he didn't come here? Oh, really? So many of his books are sold here. Uh, and next time I see him, I'll tell him he should come to Singapore. <laughs> Anyway, Kurma is from Australia. He's living over in Ireland now. I think he stays in Ireland. He stays on. In a, there's one island there where they have a temple. He's staying there. Uh, anyway, he he does he does wonderful, colorful cookbooks, cooking with Kurma. He had his own bit, uh, program on satellite TV also for a long time, cooking classes with Kurma. Very famous now. They showed the satellite programs all over the world. 
So I was distributing one of his books and this person came by and they looked at his cookbook and they said, oh, this is all sense gratification. It was all, you know, colorful dishes, very beautiful, attractive looking food. And this person said, no, this is, this is not good. This is sense gratification. You know, Buddhism, everything should be <laughs> very plain, you know. If, if there's any, any fragrance in the soap, this is Maya. The food should be tasteless. That's their idea. They, they do, I, but I said, no, I said, you have to understand this is not sense gratification. We are cooking for Krishna. This food is for Krishna's pleasure. We do not cook simply for our own sense bodies, but we cook for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. This concept is something beyond a Buddhist. However, they don't have the ability to understand the idea of trying to please the Supreme Lord. But yoga, our yoga is for the pleasure of the Lord. Our devotion, our activities, we do everything for his pleasure. We don't just chant Hare Krishna to destroy our karma, but we chant Hare Krishna mantra for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. We want to please him. We want, we're calling his name. And we want to call from the heart. As Sachinanda and Swami would often say, chant from the heart. So when we do our japa every day, we want to chant from the heart. We want to call out to Lord Krishna. To again to get his attention. Prabhupada would say chanting should be like the child calling for the parent. When you have a child, then you will you know how it is when the little child calls for the parent. So our chanting should be like that, that we are calling out to Krishna with that strong feeling that he is my shelter. He is the one who is going to protect me. He is the one who is maintaining me. And I totally surrender to him. All right? Surrender to Krishna. Six items of surrender. Anukum yashyatsantopa pratikum yashyavajana Accepting everything favorable for devotional service. What is favorable? Coming to program, association with devotees, reading Srimad Bhagavatam, worshipping the Lord. All of these activities are favorable for devotional service and rejecting what is not favorable for devotional service. What is not favorable? Probably, what is it? What is everybody going on the mobile phone nowadays? Netflix. Netflix, not favorable. <laughs> Bollywood movies, not favorable. Tamil movies, also not favorable. There, there are many things not favorable. But there's many things which are favorable. Many things which we, we have many books. We have our own Krishna conscious activities. We have no shortage things to do for Krishna's service. It's just getting the time to do everything. 
getting the time to chant and to worship Krishna, getting the time to perform the artis and do the different services. So surrender to Krishna based on these these two things, as then also knowing that only Krishna can protect us. We don't pray to others to protect us. Krishna is the one who will save us. The people of Vrindavan, they only turn to Krishna when there's danger, when there's forest fires, or when the Kaliya serpent's there, or when different demons are coming, disturbing, they just go to Krishna. They, they can't think of anyone else to save them. And only Krishna can maintain us. It's by Krishna's grace that we maintain ourselves. It's not by our hard work or by our own efforts, but it's simply by the grace of Krishna. Then we should have no desire other than Krishna's desire. That's a difficult one. We have many desires. We want all things that we want to do, but we have to ultimately Recognize what is Krishna's desire? What does Krishna want? And we have to surrender to that. And then the final item of surrender is we should always be meek and humble. Give up pride and simply take shelter of Lord Krishna. And so these six items are the guidelines for anyone who is aspiring to surrender to Krishna. We want to cultivate, we want to check how much are we coming up to these things, to meet these standards, to surrender to Krishna. And when we do surrender, then Krishna said, I will free you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. You have nothing to fear if you surrender to Krishna because Lord Krishna will take care of everything. So this, this requires faith. We have to develop that faith. And faith comes by practicing and by association, by regularly chanting the holy name, studying the scriptures, and more and more the faith will be nourished. The seed of devotion will grow. We give the example about the mango. The mangoes are green, but you leave them for some time, gradually they become ripe, they become ripe, they become ripe. So in the same way, our seed of devotion has been planted and it has to grow. It takes some time. You just have to, we have to continue. We have to maintain our spiritual practice. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, they use the word Sadaya Bhak. Sadaya Bhak, meaning stay alive. <laughs> right? You have to stay alive in Krishna consciousness. They say, what do, if your father is a rich man, what do you have to do to inherit his property? You just have to stay alive, right? Wait for the Father to pass on and you inherit everything. So the same way, devotee has to stay alive in Krishna consciousness. Just stay alive, keep practicing. 
even though you may not be feeling the ecstasy, we haven't come to that point yet to, to experience everything, the, the real bhava and the prema. We're not up there yet. We're still in the anartha, the vritti stage. But stay alive. Keep going. And gradually, one day, it will happen. More. One day it will happen. We'll go back to Godhead. It has become your rightful claim because you stayed alive in Krishna consciousness. You did not give up. You kept going. Prabhupada spoke about Indian railways. He said the trains never come on time. But he said they have a motto, keep the wheels rolling. So our devotional service sometimes it's a bit like that, you know, we're sometimes a bit slack and not inspired, not infused, but somehow keep the wheels rolling, just keep going on, make a point, keep the vows, you know, just like chanting sometimes, oh, I don't, you know, you can feel not so infused sometimes, but I have to do it because I promise, I made the vow, I want to do it for Krishna. Do it for Krishna. Just like mother sometimes doesn't feel like cooking, but she'll do it because she has a family. She has to feed the family, have a duty. It's so in the same way, we have a duty to serve Krishna. We want to keep that duty. That is Sanatan Dharma, right? We're doing Sanatan Dharma, eternal religious principle. So we'll stop here. Maybe there's some questions. Any points which need to be clarified or discussed? Yes, Prabhu. In the purport, uh, yes, Mike. In the purport, uh, Prabhupada writes that there is this, uh, when there is yoga mentioned, and then Prabhupada says, if you actually, the transcendental world is happening, other things. So, this is where uh, I think sometimes it's inconceivable that how every activity of Krishna is happening constantly. I mean, they've been told that there is no notion of time in the future world. Uh, but still, it's to understand it better that it's every activity is continuously happening. So how do you understand this, Maharaj? I know it's transcendental, but if somebody can, can share that, like every action. Well, that is his Yogam Aishwara, his inconceivable potencies. We have to accept that Lord Krishna has inconceivable potencies. And Difficult. How, how can we understand something which is inconceivable? As you say, how can we understand that Krishna is performing every activity simultaneously? Everything is going on right now. How do we? Right now, Krishna is speaking Bhagavad Gita somewhere. Certainly, Prabhupada told us that. He said, Arjuna goes with Krishna. Right now, Krishna is somewhere. He's speaking Bhagavad Gita. At the same time, right now, Krishna is holding up Govardhan Hill. At the same time, Krishna is killing the demon. All of these activities are going on at the same time. How, how can we understand it? It's inconceivable. How do we understand? We simply have to hear. We have to hear. And we have to accept that Lord Krishna can do the inconceivable. What is inconceivable to our 
limited mind and senses, it doesn't mean that Krishna can do it. Lord Krishna has inconceivable potency. Parashya Shakti Vibhadaiva Shuryate. Right? Lord Krishna possesses all of um, um, all varieties of different potency. And he can do the inconceivable. Of course, that's one of the difficulties which people have in trying to understand Krishna. They try to understand with the limited mind and senses. Our own mind and senses are certainly limited. So how can we understand what is unlimited? We can only understand the unlimited by the grace of Krishna. So Lord Krishna can reveal to us how these things happen. It's not that we understand Krishna, but Krishna reveals himself to us how he is doing these things. <coughs> so that it requires we it requires we have to look to Krishna for his mercy that kindly reveal to me how these things happen. I think it was a uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur was meditating on the Gayatri Mantra. And there's 24 and a half syllables in the Gayatri Mantra. And he couldn't figure out where this half a syllable he, And he was just wondering, where is the half a syllable? He just could not figure it out, you know. It's a great Sanskrit scholar. And he was just puzzled. Where is this half a syllable? 24 and a half syllables. And he was he, and he was thinking about it for a long, long time. It came to the point he was so desperate. He was saying, I will give up my life if I cannot understand where this half a syllable comes from. And when he was ready to give up his life, then at that time the Lord revealed to him about where this half a syllable came from. So the Lord himself acts on that. He reveals himself to the devotee when he's, when he, when he's pleased. You have to also have that strong desire. You really want to understand how Lord Krishna can be everywhere and do everything all at one time. And you have to have <laughs> that desperate desire. When you're fully desperate to know, then Lord Krishna can reveal to you how this happens. Until that time, you have to understand simply by reading the Shastras and hearing from the Acharyas how they explain everything. It's certainly inconceivable. Lord Krishna brought back 16,100 queens to Dwarka. And then he arranged marriage for each of them. He expanded himself 16,100 times and they did a fire yagya for each and every marriage. And not only did Lord Krishna expand himself, but Vasudeva and Devaki also expanded themselves and they also attended each of the marriages. How is it possible? It, it just beyond our imagination is ink. But we have to hear about these things. This is the inconceivable potency of Lord Krishna, that he can do all of these things. As Prabhupada would say, impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. 
and maybe in our dictionary, things that are impossible for us, but in relation to Lord Krishna, nothing is impossible. When Lord Krishna comes to this world, he's displaying the pastimes of the spiritual world. He's giving us a little taste what goes on in the spiritual world. So we're hearing and gradually become a little bit more conscious, a little more aware of something of the inconceivable potencies of Lord Krishna. Without that inconceivable potency, then the tendency is there for people to want to imitate Lord Krishna. And so therefore, throughout the scriptures, again and again, the inconceivable potencies of Krishna are described. So that we can understand that we can never begin to ever come anywhere near Lord Krishna. Or to do like Krishna would just be impossible. But what we can do is to hear about Krishna and to serve Krishna and to develop our loving relationship with Krishna. Yes, bro. You have a question? Well, what you say is true. Uh, 
in Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada talks about why Lord Shiva did not get up to offer respect to Daksha. But Lord Shiva is always meditating on the Supreme Lord. So he, he, and, and when we offer obeisances, when we offer respect, we don't offer respect to the body, but we offer respect to the super soul, as you say. All right? So respecting the super soul, we see the super soul in the heart of all living entities. And we respect all. We should respect all living entities. Srila Prabhupada, uh, uh, he was telling one day we, we were in this temple and it was in London and they were worshipping Brahma Vishnu Shiva. And so uh, Prabhupada, the, the devotee of Krishna, not only respects Brahma Vishnu and Shiva, a devotee of Krishna will offer respects even to an ant because they see the Lord in the heart of the insect. And so, like that, Prabhupada taught us the devotees should respect everyone. Of course, you can't go around offering obeisances everywhere, but that respect should be there. That we do try to respect everyone. And you talk about people not being received properly, well, there were, those were all special circumstances which you recounted. Certainly, Nala Kuvera and Mani Griva, they got the mercy of Narada Muni. 